Our final speaker in this morning's session is uh, Peter J. Wagner from uh, the Smithsonian Institution where he is a uh, paleontologist and uh, curator. He uh, got his PhD at the University of Chicago. This, this, you know, it's economist and a paleontologist. It's very incestuous. But anyway, uh, uh, he, he's also an extremely uh, 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 accomplished paleontologist. He too won the Charles uh, Schuchert Award, which is uh, the, you know, the highest award they give for, uh, for young um, uh, paleontologists. He's made many, many contributions to uh, macroevolution, to uh, gastropod systematics, a paleo record, to uh, theoretical morphology, paleoecology. And his uh, talk today is uh, Paleontological Perspectives on Morphological Evolution. I've got to get Joel to do all my introductions. He's like, you know, wow. <sighs> okay, what I'm going to talk about today is basically the morphological flip side to the coin Mike was talking about, the diversification of all these shapes that went with all the numbers that he's been discussing. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about this in the context of morphous phase. Morphous phase is not something that, um, well, it's a post Darwinian concept. It's not something paleontologists invented, but it's an intuitively appealing. Uh, concept for describing morphologies over time. What I'd like to do with this is, is go through the basic concepts, go through the ideas Darwin had for some of these phenomena, because even though he didn't describe things in, in graphs like this, he verbally described some of these things. And I want to go through some of the advancements paleontologists have made for addressing the issues and how well some of Darwin's predictions have held up about what's been going on. Now, the first of these issues I'm going to get at is disparity. Uh, Jonathan referred to earlier disparity. I'll, I'll be illustrating in greater detail. And you can sort of see this in the morphous face. Whoops. Here we go. Um, here we have, this is a morphous face by Mike Foote. And another reason I'm showing this is Mike has contributed extraordinarily to our morphous face and morphologic disparity studies. You'll see his name quite a bit in this. This is trilobites over the course of their history. And uh, this is based on principal components analyses of morphometric data. And what disparity is, is sort of a concept for describing the range of forms, the distributions. I'll illustrate this in more detail. It's not a term Darwin used, but he sort of verbally describes it. Um, another issue that's come up quite a bit is the issue of constraints and ecologic restrictions. And you can sort of see this in morphous face with sort of the idea that some parts of morphous face seem to be sort of off limits, which is sort of a theoretical aspect on constraints and restrictions. Perhaps more interestingly, you see parts of trilobite morphous face that are occupied and sometimes but not others. Um, why didn't they ever get back there? They had a long time to do so. And this comes up, as I said, with the ideas of ecologic restrictions, in many ways sort of a souped up version of Darwin's Finch's models, which, which we've heard discussed earlier, but then also the idea of intrinsic constraints. Um, and I say this is an and or. These are not contradictory, even though we sometimes portray them as such um, inadvertently. Another idea is trends within morphous face. For example, you seem to have sort of shiftings in this direction, perhaps within some trilobite clades. Uh, trends are very common concept, and certainly it seems to be a very Darwinian one. I'll go into some detail about the fact that actually, sometimes trends and Darwinism were, were at odds, at least in the minds of paleontologists. And of course, not illustrated here is the fact that underlying this, there is some giant trilobite tree of life, their, their little portion of it, which is, of course, all lost now. Um, and of course, you have rates of change, which, which have uh, inferences for restrictions and constraints, whether those rates shifted. And of course, trends might have to do with the rates in particular directions. Um, and something I'll come back to is, of course, this is sampling over time. As Mike alluded to, we have an imperfect fossil record. How might that be affecting things? What I want to go through first is disparity. Um, of course, one of the reasons why so many of us become paleontologists is because much of past disparity is lost. Uh, this is based on a study from uh, Matt Wills and Derek Briggs and company showing a principal coordinates analysis of arthropods. And you have a lot of disparity. Well, OK, this is a lot of insects and things. But what's really interesting is when you add the Cambrian, you see you have whole chunks of the morphous face have been pretty much eliminated. And of course, that's because we have no way of inferring from the modern fauna that trilobites ever existed. Um, and in fact, if you go through time, uh, Stockmeyer Lofgren et al. added the Carboniferous in the triangles here. And in fact, even in the Carboniferous, we would lost most of the Cambrian. And we have Carboniferous morphous face that is lost. So this historical context is quite important for looking at disparity and for the evolutionary implications thereof. I'm going to sort of walk you through what disparity is. Uh, Jonathan alluded to it, and, and we use it in everyday English. But we have quantified it. Um, 
Gould, I think, was the one who first really started using this as an evolutionary concept. Uh, Mike Foote and people like him were, th were the ones who really started quantifying it and making it a repeatable metric we could study. So let's say in our first time unit we have these, whoops, in our first time unit we have these uh, four blue species. In the next time unit we add these uh, four red ones. So what happens to our disparity? Well, there's a few ways of tallying it. Usually this is based on average pairwise dissimilarities. In other words, this trust network of distances in our morphous space between the taxa. Sometimes people use variances along these axes as well. So what happens is we go, as we increase the morphous space, we increase the disparity. Um, so in part, it's reflecting the size of the morphous space. However, most disparity metrics are not solely the size of the morphous space. Let's say we wiped out the middle in an extinction. What then happens to the disparity is it actually goes up. The morphous space hasn't increased in size. Uh, what it is is disparity is like an ecologic diversity metric. It's reflecting both the numbers and the distributions. And what's also important about this is this shows a sort of relationship between the number of taxa and the disparity, which can be evolutionarily informative. And I'm going to walk through this because this starts getting into some stuff that, that Darwin had opinions on. Now, the, um, the relationships between observed richness or expected richness and disparity uh, were really laid out by Mike Foote in a number of papers, uh, the best one being a, a paper in his 1997 volume, um, a fetch strip for Jim Valentine, who laid out a lot of the more basic concepts. And sort of the null expectation is, if we have sort of an exponential increase in richness here in the squares, it's on a log scale, so it's an exponential, and we have constant step sizes, we expect basically a linear increase in disparity. Conversely, if we get things going with a bang, we have big step size early, but we continue to increase exponentially, then you start off with high disparity, and you will increase some, but basically you get going with fairly high disparity relative to what you'd otherwise expect. And of course, there's a lot of other models. Uh, Mike showed what would happen if you had sort of a constrained system um, limited designs. And he showed many other models based on different diversifications. What I really want to focus on are these two. Um, this is fairly important because a large number of paleontological studies have shown this sort of second pattern, where disparity starts off quite high relative to richness and, and levels off or doesn't go too far. Um, I would like to stress that this 18 to 10 might not be a fair representation because I suspect that Patterns that we observe like this have sort of differentially drawn our attention. But the important point is it's obviously a fairly common pattern. Now, Darwin noticed that this existed. He refers to in the origin about the sudden appearance of major groups in reference to the Cambrian explosion, uh, but also groups like the Teleos fish and things like that. And he did suggest that this actually challenged his theory because without any computer modeling, he realized that it might be tough to get this with constant rates of evolution through time. So what he suggested is what we actually had going on was something like this, but with a lousy fossil record. He went so far as to posit that basically the pre phanerozoic record that was missing was equivalent to almost the length of the Phanerozoic itself. The numbers he used are, are greatly outdated because we had no idea of time scales back then. But that was his suggestion. So what I'd like to do is walk through a case study where we can first of all look at the disparity and compare it to what's going on with the rates because we happen to have a phylogenetic model but then also go through and look to see whether Darwin's explanation might work for, for elevated rates early. So here are tetrapods, us, plus amphibians and a lot of other things. They get going in the Devonian with fairly high early disparity, um, especially uh, relative to the richness. The disparity basically starts off pretty high and doesn't increase all that much. Um, so super, or just off the top there, it's consistent with the idea that you had decreasing rates, also perhaps increasing constraints. And this is something I'll come back to in a moment. When you take the phylogeny and plot out the branch lengths and, and basically optimize the branch lengths to the local changes, what you find is, in fact, you have major changes in rates. This is a log scale for the probability of change per character per million years. And starting the Devonian, Mississippian, Pencil going to Pennsylvania and Permian, and basically, using either classical probability tests to look at basically treating these reconstructions as data, or using likelihood tests. Either way, you reject the idea of constant rates through time. It's best fit is sort of a non-stationary decreasing rate of change through time. Um, OK, that's pretty interesting. It does suggest higher rates. But when this study was done, it basically sort of took the, the fossil record at face value. It started things off in the middle of the Devonian, which is when we find the first tetrapods. This is sort of an early Devonian tree where you see these sort of fishy-like salamanders and salamander-like fishes, however you care to think of them. Um, let's humor Darwin. Let's start earlier. Let's say we drag it down so we can have the entire Devonian to play with. 
how can we deal with this? Well, for one thing, you can't treat this in a vacuum. The phylogeny is important because we are Sarcopterygian fish who have left the ocean. Um, and in fact, there are a bunch of other Sarcopterygians. And what's very interesting is the tetrapods are actually well nested in Sarcopterygian fishes that are basically appearing throughout the Devonian. It's not like there's a big gap between them. Now, the importance of this is if we want to drag the tetrapod radiation to the base of the Devonian, we've got to drag all of these things down. Um, these would be lungfish, and these are some of the other relic and long gone Sarcopterygian groups. Um, now, Obviously, we're not expecting a perfect fossil record. These thin blue lines here, those are, the, that represents absent fossil record that's implicit to this particular phylogeny I'm, all, I'm using. So we're already saying we think we're missing stuff. The question is, can we add in all of these orange lines, these thin orange lines that are necessitated by a basal Devonian radiation of the tetrapods? How do we go about doing this? Is this plausible? Well, this might seem like a, a bit of a, a diversion, but it, it's actually not. It's quite relevant. Suppose you have a bunch of taxa. This represents a simulation of 5,000 of them with a constant extinction rate. What you get here is sort of a survivorship curve. This is on a log scale, and this might look very familiar. This is the type of thing that Simpson and Van Balen used to get at the idea that we had uh, particular extinction rates in different groups in the testes. This whole survivorship program has been very important in paleontology. However, we don't actually use durations as data. We use stratigraphic ranges. And this is the point that was first really raised by Jack Sapkowski. But Mike Foote and Dave Raup really um, made an issue of it because what's very important is preservation doesn't have a uniform effect. What happens is, yes, we're losing taxa. We're not finding all the taxa. But the shape of the curve is becoming distorted. Here we're sampling taxa, basically a 50% chance in each interval. And what's happened is the relative number of taxa known from only one interval is a lot higher uh, relative to those known from 2, 3, and 4 than it would have been if we had the actual durations. If we make the fossil record worse, this pattern becomes more extreme. And in fact, if you take it to the full extreme, where you had a fossil record where it was really lousy, everything would be known from only one interval, regardless of what the true durations were like. So Mike Foote offered a very appealing solution. Estimate the preservation, R, that I've shown here, and the extinction, mu, simultaneously. In fact, Mike's gone much, much further than this, but I'm just going to use this sort of approach for now. So anyways. What does the fossil record of Sarcopterygians look like? Well, actually, a lot of the Sarcopterygian genera, and I should point out that these analyses that have been done are all at, at the genus level. Um, basically, a lot of them do have ranges. Most of them are singletons, but many do have ranges. And if you use Foote's types of approaches, well, basically, you'd infer that the most likely sampling rate within the group, on average, was about 0.2 per interval. Uh, these are stratigraphic stages that we've been using. Um, not that bad. Not as good as, say, snails, but it's not that bad. Um, so what does this mean? Well, if we just take that number off the top and apply that in here, the probability of missing all of these taxa is quite low. And even just the probability of missing the fishes are quite low. The best case scenario, 0.08. Um, and in fact, if I used other phylogenies that had, that basically were more pectinate in here and had a greater, that pulled greater numbers of species from these clades down to these branches, in fact, it becomes even lower. So it's even dependent on the phylogeny. This is sort of a best case scenario. And moreover, I would, I would hasten to stress that what I've done here is really just create a whole bunch of new problems. Uh, there's the saying of, of robbing Peter to pay Paul, which those of us named Peter never quite understood. But I think it applies here. And because what we now need are extremely high rates of evolution the basal in the top of the Silurian. Because now we have to have coelacanths, lungfish, and all the tetrapods split off then. Or we're going to have to pull those branches down, which is going to become pretty improbable. Um, another reason is that, in fact, we still have high Mississippian rates. I didn't do anything to affect those. Um, so those still remain quite high and significantly higher than you had. And of course, despite dragging it down to the Devonian, the base of the Devonian, the Devonian rates recalculated would still be significantly higher than the Permian or even the Pennsylvanian. So in this case, trying to accommodate Darwin really does not seem to work. Um, there have been several studies that have looked at, at, at this sort of thing, looking at higher early rates. The ones I emphasize in red are not because I did them. It just seems to me that I'm the one person who reviewers picked on and insisted I put in this sort of test for Darwin's alternative. Uh, but we have this in several studies where we see higher early rates early. I'd like to stress we have many other studies in which we don't see this sort of shift. So this is not some sort of necessary methodological artifact of the way we've been doing things. We seemingly can find uh, the two alternatives here.
I want to return to the idea of constraints. Now, the, the, lowering of rates, uh, the lowering of rates is consistent with the idea of increasing constraints and increasing ecologic restrictions. I want to return to this because if we look at this in a phylogenetic context with the tetrapods, uh, we can say something more about the limitations on the morphologies and what might be underlying this. What I've done here is taken the tetrapod tree and looked at it going upwards at the number of changes and the number of varying characters. That is the number of new characters you have, a change that basically introduces a new character rather than changing one that's already been changed before. And this might look sort of familiar. This is sort of like what you see in species sampling curves in ecology, where you, know, you sample initially a lot of new species and it starts to slow down. And what's very interesting here is that um, early tetrapod disparity involves a lot of new characters. Basically, the first 400 changes produce 200 new characters. The last 1,100 uh, produce fewer than 150. So what's going on in here? Well, we can break this down into sort of three portions of the tree. We have sort of the stem group. Well, at the top, we have on one side the loose amphibia, the modern amphibians and their relatives, and the amniotes, us and reptiles. And we have below that sort of the stem group tetrapods. So what I've shown here is this is how the stem group tetrapods do on their own. Then we can add the lys amphibians. And what's interesting here is the rate at which lys amphibians gain new characters is much slower. And I want to stress here, when I'm talking about lys amphibians gaining new characters, these are new for lys amphibians. They might have been evolved el elsewhere in the tree, but they're new for the lys amphibians. And amniotes do a much better job of nearly paralleling the stem group. Now, if ecologists were looking at uh, different communities and trying to get a handle on the, beta, the shared diversity and the different diversity, um, they would use a series of techniques that can be applied here because what I want to get at is the relative size of the character spaces. So what we did here is basically based on the distribution of the frequencies of changes and the relative frequencies of changes, we're putting to the test how many characters were there that had a frequency of change greater than zero, similar to asking how many species were there that had an abundance greater than zero. And we have two support curves, or three support curves here for the number of potentially varying characters. And what you see are the lys amphibian space is greatly reduced relative to the ancestral stem um, tetrapod space. Now, this to me is really interesting because what the lys amphibia represent is essentially a re-radiation into an ancestral morphospace, space, um, ancestral ecospace, I'm sorry. Uh, these older guys are sort of grade amphibians. And moreover, you might think, well, maybe they're being competitively excluded. They were the only amphibian game in town for the most part after the middle of the Carboniferous. So if you could, if basically the only limitations were what you could do living as an amphibian, they should have been able to create the same amount of character space, yet they don't even come close, which is much more consistent to my mind with some type of intrinsic constraints because there's no reason to think that the ecologic restrictions were any different here. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the amniotes and the stem tetrapods, they look to be about the same. However, what, create, what makes this interesting is when you look at the whole picture. And that is the entire tetrapod character space seems to be considerably bigger than either of those. So it's not like the amniotes are continuing to evolve in the same character space. The only way you can really do this is if the amniotes started evolving, uh, you started to have evolution in a whole bunch of characters that were not evolving in the stem tetrapods for the amniotes, and then basically some type of character release, but a bunch of the old characters basically got turned off. So it would be consistent both with some type of constraint um, or character release. And of course, a Darwin's Finch's model scaled up to the nth degree would sort of work here, because remember, these guys are invading land for the first time in a very sophisticated way. OK, want to go on to trends to uh, sort of wrap to the close. And of course, trends have been something that are actually much more of interest to paleontologists, largely because I think we can see them so well in the fossil record. But they're also relevant because, and this sort of came up when we were talking about the possible uh, patterns of evolution within the great apes yesterday, because there are a lot of trends you really couldn't see based on extant taxa. This is a classic example from McFadden on horses. And basically, most recent horses are quite large. It'd be very difficult to guess that you had um, Eohippus or Hyracotherium, or whatever they call it these days, early on. You've had a very distinct trend. Now, what is really sort of weird to me is that 100 years ago, paleontologists thought these sorts of trends were a challenge to Darwin's ideas. Uh, this is an illustration from Osborne, basically showing his sort of genoplasmic idea of what it really was. Is, it's, it's, what it really was was orthogenesis, and the idea that these things were sort of constrained to get bigger 
and have these horns grow out in particular ways. Um, it was even more than just constraints because the idea was that this was basically up and this was going to be down. And barring some freak out of quantum mechanics, evolution was going to go that way. So this, this was a, you know, considered a challenge and a, and a rebuttal to Darwinism. I personally think it's silly on behalf of paleontology. Sorry about that. But I think we've offered a lot of better ideas and more important ones uh, since then. There are types of trends. Um, this is an illustration from Dan McShay. A classic depiction of trends is very Darwinian. Here we have a whole clade that's sort of wandering over from one condition to another. But Gould, and actually before him Steve Stanley, noted that many trends might simply represent increases in variances with some sort of boundary. Say this is body size. You can only get so small, but you can get a lot bigger. Um, there's a statistical, statistically significant change over time. The large guys are concentrated later in time, but there's no real evolutionary change. It's just due to constraints, uh, just, just due to a constraint on one end. What's also sort of an, an important contribution to the paleo by paleontologists got overlooked was from uh, Dave Raup and Steve Gould. And that had to do with the effects of phylogeny. And 10 years before Felsenstein's very important and classic paper, they published papers um, using simulations to show that if you just evolve morphology over phylogenies you know, without anything going on, you get very non-random distribution of morphologies in your, in your theoretical and hypothetical morphous phase. And here's a great example with these two characters. Here's clade 154, which is way out here on character two. And traditionally, people would have looked at this and said, oh, this has got to be a trend. This has got to be an adaptive peak. But there was nothing like that underlying. It's just an artifact of phylogeny and, and the way the characters were evolving as sort of ordered characters. Um, this is different from species selection. I'll come back to that. But basically, it's just phylogenetic artifacts. Another thing paleontologists have pointed out is that trends need not be linear. And this is a really neat study that John Alroy published a few years ago. It gets to mammalian body size. And it's a classic sort of Cope's rule, which has been variously misrepresented, but which sort of describes the fact that we were once the size of mice, now we're the size of us and, and much bigger. But what John noted is very interesting is there's sort of a hole in size space here. Um, you don't see that many medium-sized uh, mammals. And when you look at this in a general phylogenetic context, what John found is there were, in fact, two optima. Uh, and what was happening is, for medium-sized mammals, there tended to be actually tendencies to get smaller or bigger, depending on how large or small they were. And the very biggest mammals tended to get smaller as well. Overall, increases in size were more common, but there are particular places in size space where it was actually more common to get smaller. So you have two optima for small and for large mammals, not just a general size increase. Um, I can't do a talk without at least one snail example. And I think it's actually rather important because it, it, it gets back to some things people have brought up about thinking about things in a multivariate context. Trends don't have to be univariate. Uh, this is a study that Doug Irwin and I did. And what we did is took five very general snail shell characters and categorized them into sort of discrete states. So what we created was a five-dimensional hypercube um, with a bunch of separate cubes within. And each morphotype is a cell, one of these individual cubes within our five-dimensional space. And what we did is we plotted out the species richness for um, Ordovician through Devonian snails. And what you get is a distribution like this. There are a lot of cells that are very, it's a hollow curve. A lot of cells are, are fairly, um, oops, I got off by one here. Um, a lot of cells have a lot of species in them. These just sort of, sort of show you the shapes. And if you look at it in the phylogenetic context and ask how often were these cells derived, what you see is there are a handful of, of cells um, in which a handful of general shell forms that evolved many, many times. OK, this is interesting. And this might be screaming something about trends. But does it necessarily? We basically used a Raup and Gould type of approach to say, OK, we think we know what the shape of the phylogeny is. We think we know what the distribution of changes are on these individual five characters. We even think we know about basic constraints based on the number of cells we see occupied. What if we take these all into account, use simulations, how often do we replicate what we see? And the answer is, here's what the Ralph and Gould approach would sort of show in the gray here versus what we really observe. And in fact, what we really observe is the cell occupation deviates from the expectation. Uh, some of the cells are, are way too heavily occupied. And some of the morphotypes evolve much too frequently. Um, so now keep in mind, one thing I would like to stress is just given Raup and Gould alone, we're getting a lot of repeated evolution. We're getting a lot of heavy uh, repetition of cell occupation. Um, but I think this really emphasizes that 
uh, Cheatham's, Alan Cheatham's point, that we really don't want to think about trends necessarily as just happening on one axis. What's going on in any one axis is going to be dependent on where you are in other axes. But the other point I want to make is that although Ralph and Gould can explain a lot, we have to explain the difference between the two. And uh, this, is, this is my one sort of uh, semi-serious equation here, that sort of the difference between the inferred and the observed and what you expect from Ralph and Gould, Darwin's natural selection would offer a very good uh, explanation for that. And finally, to sort of wrap up, I do want to touch a little bit about on species selection and whether or not this is really um, a radical alternative to uh, natural selection for trends. Uh, we really don't have that many good examples of it. This is something Mike was, was just referring to. Uh, this is one sort of possible example by John Finarelli in which he looked at the encephalization quotient. So in other words, the relative size of the brain to the rest of the body in dogs and their relatives. And you see a trend over time. John plotted this out sort of backwards. So this is 40 million years ago. This is now. And you see a lot more brainier dogs. But what's interesting is if you plot this against the phylogeny, you have these sort of meander dogs out here, which are all quite stupid. And it's the modern dogs, and this, as a cat person, this shocked the hell out of me, the, uh, cat, the, the modern dogs are all considerably smarter. So it's not a question. It doesn't look to be a case of continuously increasing brain size. It's basically like large brain size of the synapomorphy of this one clade. And this would be sort of the general pattern you would expect from species selection. The problem is, what we really don't know is, are the rates of speciation and extinction significantly higher in these canids? And, and we, as I said, if that were the case, is it speciation? Is it extinction? We have very few examples where we can actually plot these things out. Um, and I would like to return to this because it was initially suggested that the idea of punk eek necessitated species selection. And I, I would like to discuss why I think that's really not the case. Um, when Stanley initially brought this up, he basically suggested that you know, directional change within lineage is practically non-existent. It's too low to create trends. Of course, this is something else we've heard about earlier uh, in, the, in this workshop, and I'll come back to. And therefore, he suggested what's going on is it's just differential speciation based on the traits. Okay. And this is kind of uh, important. Uh, very recently, Gene Hunt had a really cool study looking at the frequency of directional change, shifts within lineages in, in a trend-like manner versus random walks where they're just changing any which, which way, not really in a trend-like manner, and stasis, in which there actually seems to be attraction towards some mean. And what Gene found is that basically what this is the support, zero is bad, one is good. These are the number of studies that fit. Stasis and random walks did really well. Um, for most of the studies, directional change did really poorly. This would suggest that, in fact, this could be a real concern except directional change and bias change don't, well, if you don't have directional change, you can still have bias change. This is just the differences between inferred ancestors and descendants from two different studies. And what you have here is something different from what Stanley expected. It's not a symmetrical distribution where you can get a little bigger or a little smaller on each axis. They're bias distributions this way in this case, that way in the other case. Um, and I would suggest that bias changes between lineages implicates natural selection just as much as directional change within lineages would. Um, and there are many other studies suggesting this is actually a fairly common pattern. They didn't plot the data like this, so it's difficult to show. But Dan McShay has done many summaries of this. And in many ways, this is actually good news for selection, because what it suggests is that selection is actually a lot stronger, even if it's more stochastic. And uh, Landy's paper is quite important, because he showed that the uh, death rate to get the horse trend was something like one horse in a million, which was just ridiculously low. But if it's happening in a few concentrated bursts, it can be very high. And there have been other models. Uh, Fatuma's model was actually the one that Gould favored. Other ways in which selection can be potentially important. And I want to wrap up with just one reminder about extinction, which I really didn't talk about. But extinction is potentially very important, because Jablonski noted that um, it looks like Selective regimes during mass extinctions might differ from that at background times. This is not something that would have been very appealing to Darwin, um, as, as, as Mike noted. But there's good evidence for that. And there's been quite a few studies that show major alterations in morphous phase because of mass extinctions. These sort of out of the blue events are extremely important. It affects disparity in trends. And there, there have been trends that are basically just wiped out by mass extinctions. So all that work for nothing. Um, and it can also have effects, and we have to be careful about how we look at it, because one absurd way to describe the KT is a driving force for the trend within dinosaurs, for featherless to feathered dinosaurs. It's been an outcome of it, but of course, that's, it's, it's a coincidence. We really don't want to think about it like that. So to wrap up about what the fossils say, 
Um, there is ample evidence for morphologic trends. Um, bias change in particular seems to be fairly common. It's not simple. It's not cases of univariate steps in one direction always, but there are a lot of cases where it clearly is not random with respect to morphology. Um, where I think we really differ from Darwin is if I think we're suggesting a change is not as constant as he supposed. Rates are varying a bit over time. I think we have ample evidence for the expectations of both constraints and ecologic restrictions over time. And um, at least in a couple of examples, unlike Darwin's suggestion, it's not the fossil record. It's, it's not geology, it's biology. So on that note, I'll take any questions.